Welcome to Blindspot, an audio podcast series about forensic science and the role forensic experts play in our judicial system. The name Blindspot comes from the fact that forensic experts can see and hear what laypersons cannot. Forensic experts reveal the blind spot in court using their experience and expertise as forensic scientists. In this episode of Blind Spot, I'm going to discuss authenticating digital audio evidence and the importance of the authentication process for court. In a previous episode, I discussed the chain of custody and its role in authenticating audio evidence. A chain of custody is the first step in the authentication process, but it does not in and of itself authenticate a piece of evidence. I've seen plenty of cases where audio evidence was not authentic, and it was still stored in the recorder that supposedly created it. So why is audio authentication so important? What should the audio forensic expert be aware of when examining audio evidence? What's the process of examining and authenticating audio evidence? I'm going to answer these questions and more in the following few minutes. A majority of audio recordings that I'm hired to authenticate are created on digital audio recorders or smartphones using a recording app. These devices are easily concealed in a pocket or purse. They come in many shapes and sizes. They record various formats. One of the first steps that an audio forensic expert must take when authenticating a digital audio recording is to become familiar with the equipment that created that recording. The authentication process determines whether or not the audio recording in question has been tampered with. In this age of digital audio, edits can be made and covered up very easily. There's free versions of audio editing software available online like Audacity that can make edits that alter the events or conversation that originally occurred in the digital audio recording. In the last 30 days, of all the audio authentication cases I was assigned, I found two that had been edited. Both of the recordings were downloaded to a computer, edited, and then played back and re-recorded using desktop computer speakers back onto the original digital audio recorder. Most of the time, if an audio recording is edited after it's been downloaded to a computer, but before authoring a CD, the edits can be detected in the digital recording's metadata. During the forensic authentication process, the software that created the edits will be detected in the hex information of that edited recording. If the audio evidence is found to be altered, it should be ruled inadmissible in court because it's not an accurate representation of the events that occurred. So what should an audio forensic expert be aware of during the authentication process? First, establish and determine the chain of custody. If the expert is able to retrieve the evidence from the original source, in most cases, that will automatically create and establish a chain of custody. Or, provide clues of tampering if the recording was edited and re-recorded. If it's not possible for the forensic expert to retrieve the recording, then the expert must carefully go through all the documents and reports that arrive with that evidence. Sometimes, a chain of custody log from law enforcement will be included, which will strengthen the authenticity of the audio evidence. But if the chain of custody cannot be established, then the forensic examiner must rely on other techniques, as well as their own expertise, to determine the authenticity of the evidence. If further investigation reveals more inconsistencies in the recording and metadata, more often than not, that recording is determined to be altered. Digital audio recorders and smartphones aren't the only equipment that record audio evidence. Some CCTV surveillance systems, as well as most other digital video recorders, will include both audio and video in the recordings. As an audio and video forensic expert, I often work with both the video and audio from these recordings. When I receive digital media evidence that includes sight and sound, I analyze both audio and video using separate forensic processes. I've come across cases in which the video was unedited but the audio had been tampered with. 
In this case, I was unable to authenticate the evidence because a chain of custody could not be established. Plus, there were anomalies in the audio that could be measured, heard, and documented. Next, when the audio evidence arrives in our lab, I listened critically to the entire recording a number of times. During this critical listening process, I note unusual sounding sections in the recording, which are called anomalies. I take notes and place markers using forensic software like SoundForge or Adobe Audition so that I can go back and find these spots later and include them in my forensic report. These unusual sounding sections can be changes in the background ambience, inconsistent speech pacing, and wording as well as changes in the noise floor. The noise floor is a series of natural and electronic sounds that should be consistent throughout the recording. A recording's noise floor is the measure of the signal created from the sum of all of the extraneous sound sources and unwanted signals like hiss, hum, wind, HVAC like air conditioning or furnace, and other sounds that aren't part of the intended recording. After a chain of custody has been established, critical listening must be the next step to become familiar with the audio evidence. If an edit is detected during the critical listening phase, it's usually in the form of an abrupt change. Detecting these changes is not easy and comes with experience. It's important for the forensic expert to put themselves in a quiet, isolated room during critical listening so as to avoid any outside disturbances. The quiet environment enhances the critical listening focus. High-quality monitoring headphones and high-quality studio monitors or speakers are best for critical listening analysis of digital audio recordings. Professional quality headphones and speakers will have the flattest frequency response, which means they produce neutral and natural sound. This is very important for the forensic expert because subtle boosts and cuts in frequencies can impact the analysis of the digital audio recording. Sometimes frequencies may be more audible in headphones and sound clearer to the forensic expert, while other frequencies may be better heard through speakers. When the forensic expert is examining audio evidence for authentication, it's important to use both headphones and speakers to hear every aspect of the recording. In some audio evidence that I've examined, I've been able to hear a secondary noise floor in the recording. This usually occurs when a recording is played back through speakers or an auxiliary cable and re-recorded into another recorder or the same recorder that created the original recording. The original noise floor from the recording is heard along with the secondary noise floor. After critical listening, the forensic expert must use electronic measurement to further examine the audio evidence. This is done by noting the prominent frequencies in the voices or other sound source and the noise floor. The levels of the recording and the different frequencies can be measured as well. Tools such as spectrograms, frequency analysis windows, and level meters are very helpful for observing and collecting this information. The experts should note the frequency range of the overall recording, the voices or conversation, and the noise floor or extraneous sounds in the recording. If the frequency range of a voice suddenly becomes larger or smaller or shifts in frequency range, that can be the sign of an edit. Sudden unexplained changes in the noise floor level, as well as the sudden presence of another background noise, can also be a sign of an edit. As I mentioned before, I've come across recordings which I could hear two noise floors. This can often be measured and seen in a spectrogram and a frequency analysis panel. Visually inspecting the audio waveform and spectrogram is the next step in authenticating the audio evidence. This goes hand in hand with electronic measurement as the forensic expert analyzes the physical wave properties and frequency information. Waveforms are continuous and smooth when examined very closely. Even a quick, loud sound like a clap will have a smooth, continuous wave. If there are sudden breaks in the waveform of a recording, these are signs of editing. The expert should also pay close attention to the phasing of the waveform. This can also be seen when zooming in visually to the waveform. If the waveform of the recording is suddenly inverted, 
This can also mean that an edit was made. The spectrogram will show the full frequency spectrum with warmer or colder colors representing the strength of that frequency. The noise floor can be seen very clearly in this view, helping to identify breaks in the sound. All recordings have some noise floor, even if they're almost inaudible. When viewing in a spectrogram, any breaks in the noise floor may be signs of an edit. Changes in the volume of the noise floor can also be signs of an edit. When I first began working as an audio forensic expert, most of my work involved analog audio recordings, such as mini, micro, and standard audio cassettes, and the occasional reel-to-reel -reel tape. Today, almost all recordings are done digitally, and there's additional information that can be analyzed when performing an audio authentication. Digital audio recordings contain metadata, which reveals information about how the recording was made and the type of equipment that created that recording. If a recording was downloaded into a computer and then loaded into a software program capable of performing edits, there will be a footprint left in the recording hex information showing what software was used. When examining the digital information, it's also necessary to create an exemplar recording to compare the metadata and the rest of the file structure with. An exemplar is a recording that's made in the most similar circumstances as possible to the original. An exemplar is made on the same type of audio recorder and, if possible, the same type of environment. Using this exemplar, the forensic expert can compare the metadata and other file characteristics, like the hex information, the file format, uh, stereo versus mono, and determine if there are any inconsistencies. Because if there are, this can also be a sign of tampering. For a forensic expert to analyze a piece of audio evidence, the expert must prove beyond any doubt that the recording is in its original form and it's not undergone any tampering. If a piece of evidence is not authentic, it should not be used in court because it may be incomplete or altered to purport events that did not occur. This concludes this episode of Blind Spot. If you subscribe to this podcast, you'll be notified of future episodes as they're produced. We welcome your comments and questions at primoforensics at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. In this week's episode of Blind Spot, I'm going to discuss evidence recovery, specifically digital media evidence recovery. Digital media means audio, video, and images. In an earlier episode, I discussed how professional.